Assalamualaikum and good morning everyone. Welcome to the AgroFood Productive Webinar on Modern Poultry Processing in Malaysia. We have here Mr. Terry Tan as our moderator. Short introduction about Mr. Terry. He possesses more than 15 years of experience in the poultry industry, specializing in breeding farm management and broiler farm management. He is currently the managing director of KP Asli Sindran Berhad, a leading kampung chicken provider since 2009, and Pangkal Perdana Sindran Berhad, a poultry feed provider. He is also the director of Syarikat Sing Long Hang Breeding Farm Sindran Berhad, that is a pioneer in the breeding of kampung chicken since the 1970s. Aside from managing his own poultry-related businesses, he is also contributing his experience and skill to various industry organizations and associations. He is the current president of the Penang and Province Wellesley Farmers Association since 2017 and the Federation of Livestock Farmers Association of Malaysia since 2019. Now, without further ado, I will pass the session to Mr. Terry Tan. Thank you. Thank you, Cik Nadia. Good morning to all of you for being here with us today. For the webinar on agro-food productive, modern poultry processing in Malaysia, jointly organized by Agro-Food Productivity Nessus and Federation and F Livestock Farmers Association of Malaysia and supported by the MPC. I am a moderator for today and again, and the moderator for this webinar again. President of FLFAM, I'm Terry Tan. Before we begin, I would like to thank all of you for participating in our webinar and also to our panel of respected speaker, Dr. Rohaizan Binti Muhammad Ano, Mr. On Chai Kin, and technical consultant of FLFAM, Dr. Yap Teo Chong. Firstly, we will discuss the key points in poultry processing for good, safe, and wholesome poultry products. Subsequently, we will also explore the marketing opportunities for processed pro poultry products. As consumers become more educated and informed on the topics of food processing, food safety, environmental issues, animal welfare, and others, poultry producers as food pro providers have also begun to develop their operation and processes as to better serve this consumer demand and trend. In recent years, Agricultural productions and processing have has experienced significant development and evolution. Factors that facilitate this evolution, including innovation, technical development, and the advancement of science and technology in poultry productions. Today, with the insights of our speaker, we were examine a few topics and issues related to modern poultry processing in Malaysia and have a glance at how modernized methods may result in more effective and efficient poultry processing. Our speaker will also share their thoughts about the marketing opportunity for processed poultry products in Malaysian market. Let's welcome to our first speaker, Mr. Ong Chai Kin, to present his topic on key design elements in poultry processing plant. Mr. Ong is a plant manager from Dinding's Poultry Processing Sandiram Berhad. He is experienced plant manager with over 30 years of experience in poultry processing environment, skill in supervising, leading and directing tasks in order to achieve optimal productivity and results. Proficient in all aspects of factory operation, budgeting, organizing, organizations, and management, establish effective quality control and safety programs, encouraging proactive participation across a manufacturing floor, adapt at motivation team to meet goals and achieve productivity while maintaining high standards of quality expected of the products manufacturer at the facility. Uh, welcome, Mr. Ong. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Terry.
Это уже достаточно узкий. Good morning. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, can. Okay, I'm going to share uh, the key design elements in poultry processing plan. First of all, I would like to share the process and product flow and segregation is a key uh, area for us to, uh, to have the design elements in poultry processing plan and also the quality standard. We have to define the quality standard, what we are expected for this uh, processing plan. Also, we have to understand what is our customer awareness and expectations. Also for the legislation, regulatory compliance, as we are aware, in Malaysia, gas stunning and auto killing is uh, not permitted in the country at the moment. Also talk about the equipment and also building design. We have to source for the suitable equipment and building material able to meet the hygiene standards. And also we have to consider for the future expansion if needed. The process flow, we have to consider mainly from the area of supply chain and also cold chain. We need to define the process uh, capacity and also define uh, how many birds per hour and weight range, also the average bird in turn for the uh, process flow chart and also process uh, design. For the process requirement, we have to consider bleeding time, scalding temperature, either air chilling or water chilling, and also the chilling temperature. Product specification, we need to identify what type of the cutting, either we want to process for the eight piece cast or nine pieces cut, or even 10 pieces cut, and also the weight range. As for the quality standard, we need to know whether we want to produce for local market or export market. And basically for the plant fundamental design basics, the process flow, people flow, material flow, air flow, and also process water flow is uh, very, very important in terms of the design. Mm -hmm. So uh, here is the process and also building design concept. First, we talk about this uh, truck leverage. And then we also identify the building block as a liper, defeathering, administrations, chilling and cutting hall, warehouse and dispatch. We also had to uh, segregate by the low care, basic care, medium care, and also the other area also considered basic care for warehouse and dispatch. We also to consider how we want to put out our local and also canteen, the material store and also utility support in order for her to design a proper flow like the process, how the process should be flow from the low care, basic care, medium care, again, back to the basic care. <clears throat> and for the people flow, we had to have segregation for low care, basic care, medium care, and also the dispatch area. Then for material flow, mainly we have to come from another part of the building, which mainly is 
surrounded the building block. Also for the utility. And then for the airflow, we have to consider the airflow so from the median care to the basic care to the low care. And of course, the process water flow is also very, very important in order for us not to cross contaminate all the design uh, factors. So you can see from this uh, uh, block chart, uh, there is a straight line processing from lightbird truck leverage to lightbird defeathering, administration, chilling, cutting hall, warehouse and dispatch, and then go to the loading dock. So we also have to focus on the machine selections. Basically, for the modern plant, we are also talking about the outstream house design for suitability. In this case, we are looking for auto bird catcher. What is so good about the auto bird catcher? We are talking about the better load quality, improved animal welfare, more profit and productivity, also higher bio security and easy to clean. And beside that, this uh, auto bird catcher, based on the design, we also can see we are using belt conveyor, which able to reduce uh, the number of catcher and also able to reduce the bruises also for the catching time. And this uh, automation equipped with the weighing system to provide the net weight of the bird we are catching. At the light bird leverage, we also had to segregate for not so clean area and also clean area. And then we had to have the truck washing area, also at, to have the clean drawer and truck to pick out area. To reduce the bird stress and painting, we need to equip with the blue or red lighting good ventilation system, adequate air change, misting system, sufficient leverage time. Uh, these parameters is also to consider whether the temperature control at this area, it is a uh, good to calm down the birds. And for the sufficient leverage time, basically we are looking at about half an hour to two hours. The automated to drive higher efficiency, if we want to compare the conventional way and the modern <clears throat> processing plant, you can see the conventional way, we always using coop system. The modern plant, we are talking about the drawer system. What is so good about the drawer system compared to the coop system? You may aware that the coop system we only can contain the birds, about 10 to 12 birds in a single coop. And then for the drawer system, we're able to contain about 300 birds. And also for the coop system, we have to step out to eight or nine steps. And this is also in terms of the operations, uh, there's a risk for people in terms of the safety Sometime during the activity, it may fell down. And then compared to the drawer system, which is uh, fully automated, we had the benefit of the cleaning. It's easier to clean out for the drawer compared to the cook system. And then in terms of the handling, there's so much more uh, benefit and also efficient compared to cook system. As for the manual Giza harvesting, compared to the fully automated harvesting as today modern plant, which you can see the efficiency is uh, so much improved. The conventional way of harvesting this uh, Giza and also liver, we are using a lot of these operators, also using scissors to separate the Giza from the Ziploc pack compared to fully harvested 
is a giblet system which we don't need any operators in this area. The system is a very effective and efficient. For the conventional plant, after we process the birds go to the spin chiller, if let's say we have to use rehab method, rehab into the conveyor belt. If we are using uh, air chilling, there's a continual flow. And for the people to do the grading is a challenge. For the modern plant, we are implemented or we are using this uh, camera system or image system, which we can uh, use in the picture as a reference. We can define the quality levels based on our needs, based on our defined process area and also others criteria. And the grading we can grade out to many level as we wish. We can grade according to our customer expectations which is a very consistent and also can produce a very good results. And for the manual cut compared to automated cutting, the manual cut basically we only can cut four to five birds per operator per minute mm -hmm. compared to the machine cut, which the capacity is much higher in terms of the cutting accuracy, the newer version of the automated cutting machine, which also can perform a very good accurate mm -hmm. cutting and also can meet all the key customer specifications, especially we talk about the young standards and also others uh, interna international standards where no problems uh, to meeting with the newer version of automated cutting machines. The automated cutting machine, we can cut for either nine piece, eight piece or 10 pieces. It's depending on how we construct or how we customize the machine. Which ACN, we can have a very high speed the cutting accuracy, the quality is very consistent and also will reduce the risk compared to the manual cutting, which uh, you see the people, sometimes they will injure during a cutting. The ACM, we will take away all these fears from the operators. And also, we are able to cut for the multiple uh, parts and also different requirements. You can see from the picture, the ACM, we also can cut for either tree joint, mid joint, drummer, and also a uh, quarter cut, quarter leg, anatomical leg, bone in tie, transit. And <clears throat> this automated cutting machine will be in line with the data captured by weighing system and also image system can facilitate the ACM machine can perform precise cutting based on the predefined program. And this machine also can have the optional bypass cutting modules to provide flexibility based on the customer requirements. So also we can based on the bell curve and also quality of the birds to produce the SKUs for specific parts. For the breast deboner, there is a many uh, version in the market. This is a fully automated breast deboner. We have the optional can produce for different SKU. We can have the butterfly cut, single breast, double breast, and also a uh, breast with the inner fillet, or we have the separated fillet. So with this all automated machine, we will reduce the 
handling and will improve our product quality in terms of the microbial. And this ACN, this uh, auto breast deboner, we also can meet all the key customer specifications. We also talk about this uh, inline automated tie deboner with very high throughput, consistent yield, and improved efficiency. The manual tie deboning basically per person we only can debone about six to eight pieces per minute. For the machine, we able to debone out to 200 or 240 pieces per minute, which is a very high speed machine. It can be in line, mm -hmm. equipped with the ACM mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And beside all this uh, equipment, the cutting equipment, we also focus on the comprehensive packing solutions. Prior to the packing, we also talk about the X-ray machine. We also consider this uh, robotic arm, we can do all the high premium product packing with this uh, thermoforming machine. Of course, we also can have the belt grader to have the individual parts and also assemble parts and all the different type of packing. And this will make our operators uh, so much easier and also simpler to manage our production area. And of course, with all these uh, cuts are parts, we also look into our report generations. We're talking about the instant informations. With the modern plan, we also using the production control software compared to conventional plan, which we are using this Excel spreadsheet. With this modern plan, production control software, we able to provide this instant info, talk about the input, and then compare to the output. And of course, also we able to trade the sales order fulfillment status. And also we able to come up with all the KPIs, talk about production, productivity, quality, equipment performance, as well as OEE, overall equipment effectiveness. And we aware that with the conventional plant operation method, especially after we pack our products, we had to do the sorting based on the SKU. At our conventional plant, we require a huge space or footprint to do the sorting based on the SKU. It's all depend on how many SKU we have. With today modern plant, we can reduce the footprint we can build the temporary hold, holding stock storage area, which also can be automated. We don't need operators, I mean, to do the sorting. All the products produced after creating will go direct to this temporary storage system. And upon this uh, sales order picking, we can call out from this uh, temporary storage area by customers, mm -hmm. also by order, which is a uh, very flexible. This is mainly for the fresh products. As for the frozen products, as we are aware, as a conventional plant, we are using blood freezer to do the freezing. And before we do the freezing, we have to sort out all the products. And by batching, we were to transfer into our brush freezing. And we had to have the specific downtime inside the freezing area without uh, knowing that either it's whole chicken, uh, color parts, and also bonus products. We had to use the same amount of the freezing time if let's say we are missing all the parts in the blood freezer. Compared to modern plant we are using, carton freezer. 
cut term feasor, we can have uh, either single retention time or multiple retention times. So single retention time is about the same with the blood feasor, which we are talking about. The tail time is the same. If the design is uh, for eight hours, 10 hours, will be fixed at eight to 10 hours. And then we have the flexibility. We also can design for the multiple retention times, which we can aim for the different product for different timing. We also can sort out according to the time we can predefine either the bonus product we want to fix for six hours, call out product we want to fix for seven hours, and hope we want to fix for, for 10 hours, which we can be programmed. And also this product can be called out upon our sales order picking. We can align with fresh and also frozen to do the sales order picking at the same time. So for the storage, as of today, modern plan, we can consider using this uh, automated storage and also retrieval system. We are talking about the ASRS. The benefit of the ASRS is uh, increased throughput capabilities, increased accuracy levels, provides highest possible storage density, safe out floor space, enhanced product security, provides real-time inventory control. Of course, with this uh, ASRS, we can do so much than what I share here. We also talk about, we can practice the FIFO. We can on hold certain products in the, by demand the system. And we also can reserve a certain stock for the priority as a customers and also for the assignment for container. Beside that, we also can in line with our this uh, loading process, which we can use a uh, auto guided vehicle or laser guided vehicle. Without the operators, we also can call out all the stops. We can go direct from the storage to the trucks. And this is a very advanced system. And in the modern plants, all this uh, technologies available is all about mm -hmm. how we want to design the plan. What is our automation level we are talking about? And we today, technology and also automations, we can do a lot more. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ong, for your variable sharing. And I can see a lot of slides that are talking about a lot of technologies. And uh, thank you for your valuable insights on the key design elements in a poultry processing plan. Uh, Mr. Ong just highlighted the automations to drive a higher efficiency and a new technology to drive a consistent quality such as the ACM, just what you can see from his slides. And the ASRS, the cold chain system, uh, this is a current technology that we should look into that. And uh, I believe uh, the Europe and uh, other developed country, they have been uh, adopting this technology. Uh, in Malaysia, I believe that uh, there, there are some plants, they are using this technology as well. And uh, we can see from the presentation of Mr. Ong, uh, some of the people are moving to the digitalizations, big data and IoT or technology. And once again, thank you for your sharing your valuable experience in the industry. And uh, I, I believe that there, there will be a lot of questions from the floor to seek for your answers about the modern slotting plants. Next, we go to the second speaker. Let's welcome to our second speaker, Dr. Rohaizan Binti Mohamad Ano. To present his to present her topic on control points and critical control points in poultry processing. Dr. Rohaizan was graduated from UPM in 2006 
and joined FFM Farms in Jirambahat in 2006 as farm veterinarian. They're responsible in flock health and biosecurity management in the layer farm. She started her career in Department of Veterinary Services in 2009 at Veterinary Inspection Section. She is currently the Senior Assistant Director at Veterinary Inspection and Certification Section, Veterinary Regulatory Division, Department of Veterinary Services, where she is in charge of veterinary inspection of processing plant and poultry slaughterhouses in Malaysia. We coordinate the veterinary inspection for export application to Singapore, China, Indonesia, Japan, and other countries. She involved in the inspection of processing plant and overseas abattoir for local raw material requirement. She is actively involved in meat inspection train, training as a trainer for DBS meat inspector and poultry processing plant. Uh, welcome, Dr. Rohaizan. And the floor is yours, and um, go ahead. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Terry, for the introduction. The topic that given to me uh, is control point and critical control point in poultry processing. And I think this topic is very technical and I will try to make it as simple as possible for the better understanding. Okay, this is my presentation outline. I will talk briefly on what is HACCP, uh, control point, critical control point and critical limits. The importance of uh, hazard implementation in poultry processing, the seven principles of hazard, and I will discuss on uh, what is the factor that contributing the failure of the hazard system. Okay, I think everyone is uh, familiar with hazard, which is a universally uh, recognized approach. Uh, for preventing uh, the food system failure. Uh, HACCP is a systemic approach, a management system for the assurance of food safety. It identifies, evaluates, and controls hazard, which is biological, physical, chemical, and allergen, if applicable, to ensure the food safety. There are three main keywords in HACCP, which is uh, prevent, reduce, and eliminate. The word hazard stands for hazard analysis, critical control points. For the control point, it's an action or procedure that will reduce, prevent, or eliminate a potential hazard. For the critical control point, it's a step at which a control measure is applied. And for the critical limit, it is a maximum and or minimum value for controlling a chemical, biological, physical, or allergen, if applicable parameter. So when we talk about HACCP, we keep asking what is the importance of HACCP implementation in poultry processing. Uh, actually, meat and poultry products are sensitive to microorganism contamination by bacteria, viruses, and parasites. Uh, after contaminated, the meat and poultry product uh, provide an excellent environment for the growth of the bacteria. And the bacterial contamination and growth is a problem because it may result in the food illness, the foodborne illness. Other than uh, microorganism contamination, uh, such as physical and chemical residue, might be accidentally contaminating the poultry product during production or marketing stages. So the hazard system will improve the product safety by anticipating and preventing the hazard before they occur. Okay, there are a few benefits of implementing HACCP, which is uh, improvement of processing procedure efficiency, decrease of product recalls, meet the regulatory demand, such as DBS and other agencies, and also the importing countries. When you want to export to other countries, you need to have the HACCP. Enhancement of firm reputation will, uh, will lead to cost reduction. And the last one is increase of profit due to customer confidence. So this is the seven principles of hazard. 
Uh, one, principle number one is identification of hazard and determination of control measure. Number two is determination of CCP. Number three is uh, we need to establish the critical limit for each CCP. Number four, establish a monitoring sy system for each CCP. Number five, correct action for deviation that may occur. Number five, establish verification procedure. And the last one is record keeping and documentation. So by looking on example of practice uh, production, uh, actually uh, the seven principle hazard can be implemented uh, starting from the receiving of raw mat during the production and also after the production to uh, until to the distribution of the practice. This is to ensure that the practice is safe for the consumer. Okay, the most important things uh, to, to develop Hazard or to start hazard is to have knowledge and experience with regard to the product, raw material and process, and the hazard itself. So this is the product description. I just want to share the uh, product description is a uh, important document that contains a complete document of the specific product that can be used. Uh, the information such as uh, like for example the highlighted one uh, is for the principle number one. Okay, as you can see in the slide, this is the basic process flowchart for frozen uh, or chill whole chicken. Uh, the process step uh, start from the receiving library, hanging, antimortem inspection, standing, bleeding, scalding, defeathering, washing, heat, heat removal, feed cutting, evisceration, postmortem inspection, washing inside and outside, spin chilling, packing, storage, and distribution. Uh, from the process flow chart, we can see that the raw material or packaging material that involved, uh, such as live bird, water, chlorine, plastic bag, or ice. Uh, in Actually, in additional requirement for the poultry slaughterhouse, the, the premier shall have a uh, meat inspector in line at the antimortem inspection and the postmortem is inspection to carry out meat inspection. This is to ensure that the meat uh, from animal is free from the disease, uh, wholesome and safe for human consumption. Okay, we go to the principle number one, the most important step in the hazard, which is identification of hazard and determination of control uh, measure. So this is an example of uh, how we do the uh, principle number one. We need to uh, to identify all to identify all the hazard and the control measure. Uh, we need to list all the raw material ingredients and the process step. And then we need to identify the potential hazard for each ingredient. There are four types of uh, hazard, which is biological, chemical, physical, and allergen, if applicable. And then we need to analyze the hazard based on food safety hazard matrix and establish the control measure. All the information need to be documented in the hazard analysis worksheet. So that both uh, need to do to do the principal one. Okay, uh, this is an example of hazard analysis worksheet for the raw material, principal number one. So we need to list down all the uh, raw material or packaging material uh, in the worksheet. And then uh, I take an example of the raw material, uh, for example, life bird. So from here, we need to, the, bio, the potential biological hazard, such as salmonella, species, E. coli, campylobacter, and extra, etc. And for chemical, maybe antibiotic residue, a pesticide, or physical, sand, or feather, uh, and others. So uh, each hazard need to analyze by using the hazard uh, matrix. So we go to the next, I will show you. This is the food safety hazard matrix. Uh, it is a, a risk evaluation multiplication of the uh, likelihood and severity uh, of a hazard in the food. So as you can see, this is the likelihood and this is the, the severity. For value number one until 10, it's essential to have a control measure in place to reduce the food safety. For value number 11, until 25, it depends on the hazard team to decide whether it is uh, to have a control measure in place to reduce the food safety hazard. Now we go back to the 
hazard analysis worksheet for the raw material. Uh, once we do the analysis based on the food ha uh, hazard matrix, uh, we need to determine the rationale for inclusion or exclusion as a hazard for each the significant hazard. So this is for example, and then we need to determine the preventive measure or control applied to prevent this significant hazard. For example, we maybe we can buy live food from the reliable or the reputable supplier that provide assurance. Uh, for example, from my gap farm. So, okay, this is uh, the principle number two: determination of critical control point. Uh, we are using the CCP decision tree for the raw material and process step. So CCP decision tree is a tool to decide whether the hazard, the, the hazard control point is a, a critical control point or not. So this is an example of the principle number two. As you can see, uh, the, for the raw material, there are three questions that we need to answer to check whether it is hazard or not. So this is the raw materials CCP decision three, uh, three question that we need to answer. And the question will lead to the answer whether it is a sensitive, uh, the sensitive raw material is CCP or not. Okay, this is the hazard analysis worksheet for the process step. Uh, for the principle two, as you can see, there are four question. Okay, this is the process step CCP decision three. And all the, um, the question will lead uh, to decide whether uh, the, the process step is critical control point or not. Okay, uh, I'm going to show the example of CCPs in the poultry processing plant. Uh, okay. So, uh, for example, evisceration, spin chilling, inside outside washing and storage, and also the metal detector and cooking. So next is uh, principle number three, uh, determination of critical limit. Critical limit for each CCP shall be specific, stable to prevent, reduce, eliminate the hazard. CL is whether qualitative or quantitative. An example of qualitative is zero tolerance of fecal spoilage. It must be supported by documents such as SOP, specification, validation, and training. And for the quantitative, such as a temperature, time, pH, sieve size, and others. Okay, critical limit must be validated. The source can be from scientific publication, regulatory guidelines, expert or experimental studies, maybe in-house experiment, experiment done in the processing itself. Okay, beside critical limit, there is another term, operating limits, also called as action limit value, criteria that are more stringent than critical limit to reduce the risk of a deviation. Operating limit may be selected for various reasons, maybe due to quality reason or to avoid exceeding a critical limit. So this is an example of critical limit, limit for each uh, CCP. As you can see from the slide. Okay, now I proceed to principle four, uh, monitoring system for each CCP. A monitoring system shall be established for each CCP relative to its critical limit why we need to monitor to detect deviation or to identify trend towards loss of control at CCP and take action to correct the situation before a deviation occur. Uh, there are four main uh, questions for the monitoring. Uh, what to monitor, how to monitor, when and who. This is to assess if the CCP is operating within the critical limits. So this is uh, the example of uh, what, what to monitor, for example, product temperature and how to monitor, we are using uh, the thermometer. And then, uh, when to monitor is according to a determined uh, frequency. There are two types, whether continuous monitoring or non-continuous monitoring. Continuous monitoring is preferred. Continuous record need to be observed periodically. The example of continuous monitoring, such as time and temperature recording chart or metal detector. Uh, and, and for the non-continuous monitoring, it must be used when continuous monitoring is not possible. This one is, is such as temperature check of cooked meat at specified interval. So who is going to monitor the critical limit? Uh, actually, any, any personnel that is well trained in the CCP monitoring technique 
such as line operator, supervisor, QC personnel can monitor the critical limit. So next we go to principle number five, determination of corrective action for each CCP. Corrective action need to be done when deviation at the critical limit occur is to prevent food hazard from reaching customer or consumer. Corrective action shall be done to both product and process. So this is an example of uh, CCP monitoring log sheet. As you can see, the CCP monitoring procedures is uh, critical limit and corrective action information need to documented in the CCP monitoring log sheet. Next is the principle number six, the determination of verification procedure. The organization shall establish and maintain documented procedure for verification. The purpose of verification to determine whether the hazard plan is working or the operation are in compliance with hazard plan or to demonstrate ongoing effectiveness of hazard system. So uh, from the slide, you can see uh, this is the verification that we can carry out such as internal audit, management review, or other monitoring activities such as at the CCP location, frequencies, creative action, calibration, and product testing. So other than verification, we can do validation. Uh, the validation is by obtaining evidence in uh, advance to ensure the implemented hazard system will effectively control the hazard. So it can carry out by uh, hazard plan prior to implication, control measure, when there are changes to the operation. Okay, this is an example of validation activities such as shelf life of the product, specification, CCP determination and critical established and etc. Okay, the last one of the principle number seven is the documentation and record keeping. The establishment shall establish a documented hazard system and shall maintain the hazard system. The hazard record that should be uh, maintained uh, such as hazard plan, uh, hazard analysis worksheet, CCP of uh, record of the CCP monitoring, record of corrective action, or record of verification activities. So uh, we we keep here uh, news uh, about the food uh, born in nurse, uh, and then uh, we know that something is not right about the hazard system. So. Uh, Actually, when we go back to the seven principles of hazard, each uh, principle might be contributing the, to the failure of the hazard system. For example, we can have a look to the principle number one. Uh, it could be due to the hazard identification, maybe lack of the technical knowledge, or the hazard identification not done thoroughly. Or it could be due to ineffective preventive measure, or the preventive measure not in place. For the principle number two, maybe the CCP uh, due to the lack of understanding uh, decision tree and the identification done not proper or not updated review on stability and verified. And for the principle number three, for the critical limit, maybe the critical, critical limit not appropriate. It could be based on could be instead of should be not validated and not updated and review on uh, suitability. And for the principle number four, maybe the monitoring, there's uh, inadequate monitoring frequency, uh, improper uh, monitoring method, or the monitoring not carried out properly, not updated, and review on the suitability. And for the principle number five, uh, it could be to the correction ineffective, fail to remove hazard, and fail to prevent recurrence, or the correction is incomplete or not in place. And for the principle number six, uh, the verification might be not done, uh, not comprehensive uh, due to lack of uh, understanding and lack of skill personnel not in place, or it could be just for the sake. And the last one is the principle number seven, which is documentation. Maybe the document not updated, inappropriate, or improper. Okay. Next, a lack of management, commitment, lack of awareness of HACCP, lack of personal training, variability of product lines and individuality of each product and customer demand, and small size of enterprise uh, have been found have negative effect on HACCP implementation in poultry processing. And also the cost of development uh, as 
as well as uh, maintenance of the system constitute seem seem uh, constitute to the uh, constraint. Okay, as a conclusion, HACCP was designed to prevent hazardous product from leaving the uh, manufacturing or processing facility. The proper and comprehensive for the identification of uh, control point and CCP are to ensure the implementation, implementation of HACCP system is in place and effective. The key to success of HACCP are the top management commitment, competency of the HACCP team member and employee training, behavior and attitude. Although HACCP provides assurance that poultry is safe, there is no way to completely eliminate all hazard. So HACCP is most effective when used with other control system. Okay, with that, I think uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Dr. Rohaizan. Pass to Mr. Terry for the next session. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Rohaizan, for your comprehensive presentation. And uh, it's, it's, it's very detailed. After that going through your uh, listening to your presentation, I think I believe all of us have a, a good knowledge uh, the importance of a uh, HACCP and uh, we should practice that in the industry. Okay. Then we move on the, we don't, don't, we will proceed with the third speaker. We will proceed with the third speaker, uh, Dr. Yap Tiong Chong, uh, our technical consultant of FLFAM again and uh, Dr. Yap we will see you again here and uh, you could please turn on your, uh, your, your, your video maybe. Alright, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Yap. Today he is going to present uh, the topic of uh, market segments for Processed poultry products. He is a veterinarian graduating from the University of Melbourne in 1972. His postgraduate study include, included a diploma on food hygiene and veterinary public health from the Royal Agriculture, Agriculture University, Copenhagen, and a master's degree from uh, Murdoch University, West uh, Australia. He has worked in the Department of uh, Veterinary Services for 14 years, 20 years in the Malaysian poultry industry, and 10 years with WHO and FAO as an international expert on AI and food safety risk mitigation in poultry supply chain in various countries. Currently, he is now a technical consultant to FLFAM. Uh, welcome, Dr. Yap. And, uh, I hope that you enjoy the last presentation in this webinar number nine. Uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Yap. Okay, thank you, Mr. Tarek, uh, our moderator for the day. And um, good morning, uh, participants and ladies and gentlemen. Um, I, my topic today would be actually to talk on the market segments on the for poultry, uh, processed poultry products. Uh, it's a very big uh, topic. Uh, I'll try to uh, synthesize as much as I can into 30 minutes. Now the poultry industry is a very uh, robust, a viable industry. It has uh, more than 3,000 farms with an average growth rate of about 5%. Of course, lately, in the last few years, uh, it probably only uh, growing at about 1% to 2%. The has a very big, large uh, ex farm value of nearly 10 billion ringgit. And daily, there's probably about 1.8 uh, currently uh, about chicken mar marketed every day in Peninsula, Malaysia to uh, various channels and market segments. And uh, pro of course, uh, poultry products are a stable source of protein in the country. Malaysia uh, consumers actually eat a lot of chicken and a lot of consume a lot of eggs. We are, have one of the highest per capita consumption in the, in the world actually. Now, 
I'm going to spend a little bit of time here talking about the uh, marketing pathways because I think to understand this uh, subject of uh, market segments, we first have to understand the marketing pathways uh, whereby how the products from the farm gets down to the market and gets down to the consumer. Now, there are basically two, uh, I've given uh, two shades here. One is in yellow, another in blue and green. And you can see that um, follow the yellow, yellow line uh, would be from the smaller uh, individual uh, broiler farms and coming to what's called a, a group of uh, traders called live wholesalers. And they would normally have also probably have uh, slaughter facilities or they could go direct to the traditional markets. Now, traditional markets can be subdivided into uh, wet markets and dry markets. Now, this uh, Hobart Libert uh, wholesaler may also send the product directly to the to the uh, traditional market. But this is a, a used to be a very big uh, pathway avenue to, before because uh, previously wet markets were very much in force, but today many of the wet markets are replaced by dry markets. So as such. Uh, and also mini marts and so on. As such, now we have gone into what you call uh, a lot of slaughterhouses. Now there are two types of slaughterhouses. I will go that into that a little bit more. Um, but you see the other green pathway where we have seen this transformation in the poultry industry, where a lot of the uh, smaller farms have been taken up under the umbrella of integrators, uh, mainly as contract farms. So today about 80% of our small broiler farmers are working as a contract farms, or contract farmers to the integrators. Now, so, so a lot of these integrators are also still selling their bird to the whole bird, uh, live bird wholesalers who then subsequently slaughter them and take them to the market. The, the also the, the integrator, many of them now have developed their own slaughterhouses and from their own slaughterhouses, then they come out with what's called already a processed product. That processed product will find itself again to product distributors or wholesalers and then to the market. And at the same time, some of these uh, slaughterhouses in the, in, the, in the integrator, many of which are actually uh, in the VHM uh, logo. That means they are veterinary inspected under the jurisdiction of the Department of veterinary services. And I think you heard Dr. Rohaizan talking about HACCP just now, control points and HACCP. She is talking largely about this group of slaughterhouses. Now, unfortunately, this group of slaughterhouses are not, uh, the non vision uh, don't really practice the HACCP or the, 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 um, the GMP uh, practices uh, in many of these uh, slaughterhouses. Some may we do, but most of don't. Now, the integrators here, the slaughterhouses can be very big, different level of sophistication. I think you heard this morning uh, a presentation by Mr. Ong Chai Kin, and he's talking about the latest uh, modern technology in VHM uh, slaughterhouses, but of course, um, some are not as sophisticated as the one that uh, Mr. Ong presented. But nevertheless, they be belong to the ca category of VHM local plants. This, by the way, the non VHM uh, slaughter facilities are largely under the jurisdiction of the uh, municipal councils. Now, if I were to trace that, that, where do they go to? I say they go to distributors, but they also go direct to the traditional markets. And a lot of traditional markets are actually taking from, from this kind of uh, slaughterhouses. And beside that, uh, they also sell to some of the uh, modern trade uh, uh, or horeca, but not so much to the modern trade now because modern trade uh, are more akin now to sending, receiving the product from VHM uh, logo plants but uh, we'll come to modern trade a little bit more. Uh, the, the, 
the uh, slaughterhouses that are in the uh, VSHM category, they also supply to manufacturers. And then, and from there, it goes also to the QSR. Of course, the many of the VHM slaughterhouses also go direct to modern trade and also go direct to QSR. Now, what about for export? Export, uh, we have from the contract farmers, uh, the, uh, the integrators and under the supervision integrators, we have been exporting live bird and eggs to Singapore. But from the uh, slaughterhouses, we can also, uh, we have been and they can export poultry products for the export market, uh, Singapore, Japan, uh, Hong Kong, and so on. Um, the, the other thing is uh, many of the manufacturers are also exporting the products um, that is a pr process, further processed product. Um, of course, some of these uh, FPP manufacturers, they are also importing, um, importing some of their raw material from other countries as well. We'll talk more about that some other day. Now, the, it is uh, important here to recognize that uh, this line of uh, marketing still is a, a very substantial line of marketing, probably about still about 50% of the birds of the, of the total production are going through this kind of uh, live bird wholesalers and non-VHM slaughterhouses going into the traditional markets and also to uh, some of the horeca as well. The, the, uh, the other thing is of course, um, this integrator uh, are going to the modern trade, which are also taking up a fair bit of percentage. The, the uh, integrator contract uh, slaughterhouses do sell some of their product to the wholesalers, which also take to some of the traditional markets as well as to Horeca. So I think in a nutshell, you can see that um, this is a very complex marketing pathway. Um, they overlap somehow, uh, although there are some major, major uh, trends uh, that one can identify. And there are some minor trends now. It used to be a major, but now a minor trend. Uh, of marketing pathway. There are the number of poultry integrators, we can uh, quickly summarize and say there are about 15 of them, uh, big and small. Um, some are just mainly on eggs, some are both eggs and broilers. Uh, and some are more specializing on dale chicks and so on and so forth. But most of them, uh, many of them, uh, the, those that are dealing with broiler would also have slaughterhouses. Now, in contrast, I was talking to you about some of the small uh, slaughterhouses uh, versus some of the uh, slaughterhouses in the integrators uh, wearing, wearing the VHM logo. But VHM represents veterinary health mark. Now, veterinary health mark is a logo issued by the Department of Veterinary Services. Uh, I think uh, you can easily identify that. Uh, Dr. Rohaizan was the one who was talking about this. Now, in many of the uh, small slaughterhouses that are not under the VHM, the, the hygiene and sanitation is very questionable. And I think this, unfortunately, are the ones that are going into the uh, wet markets, especially. And I think this is something that we need to look at uh, wet markets and dry markets. Whereas the, uh, this VHM logo is going to more of the modern trade. Now, I'm gonna look at seven uh, market segments. Now, when I define market segment here, I also include manufacturers. Uh, some authorities will not uh, define manufacturers as a market segment. Uh, but here I'm looking at market segment from the definition of from producers and processors point perspective. And therefore, uh, uh, manufacturer, which normally we would define as what we call an end user. That means they take the product and then they would manufacture it to go on to that. To the, but it is nevertheless a market segment of the producer. 
is a market segment of the producer, market segment of the processor, but you don't normally consume food from the, uh, directly uh, at, the, at the manufacturer's premises. But uh, the rest uh, are very uh, understandable. Uh, modern trade, uh, these are, I've covered just some market, uh, traditional market. I'll talk a little bit more about traditional markets in a little while. Uh, modern trade are the hy hypermarkets, supermarkets, mini marts, food marts. Now, mini marts, there are many, and that, that include um, all the uh, super fresh, uh, fresh farm, fresh product, this kind of uh, mini marts, food marts. Now, the another term that's uh, very commonly used is Horeca, which stands for hotel, restaurant, and cafe. I'm going to take this actually this definition and abbreviation that comes from European industries. Uh, in our Malaysian context, the word restaurant is a lot more, and cafes even. Restaurant and cafes are more, there's more diversity in this category than in the, in the European context. I think if you go to Europe, you don't see so many, don't such a, see a, such a wide variety of restaurants. But I think here, um, you see restaurants here in, in Malaysia uh, in a very diverse point of view. Uh, even sometimes in a coffee shop, they call it a restaurant. Um, then of course, there are very well-defined quick service restaurants um, where you can have a quick uh, serve meal, uh, you queue up at the counter and, uh, and then you can get your, for the dine-in or to take away, and or they, they also do delivery, especially in this uh, COVID-19 days. And some now, and many of them now have also drive through uh, or drive in. So you don't even get out of the car in many of these uh, QSR restaurants. I talked about manufacturers just now, I'll come back to this again a little bit. They are basically the people like Rumley Burger uh, or people, uh, a company like Mac, Mac Food which mainly service to McDonald. There's one segment that is uh, coming up uh, in a little bit more uh, prominence uh, today, especially in the COVID-19 days, and it's e-commerce. And these are supported very often by food delivery services. You can have Food Panda, Grab Food, and what have you. And uh, so you can order uh, your favorite pizza, or you can order your favorite uh, chow mein or whatever, uh, fried noodles, Hokkien fried noodles, and so on and so forth, uh, through uh, a lot of these uh, food delivery services. And this, especially for the people who are busy or cannot go out because of COVID-19, it has now become a new norm. Now, uh, whether how, how strong will it be uh, after COVID-19 is still left to be seen, um, to be gauged, to be assessed. Uh, one of the things that e-commerce has not taken off before because in Malaysia, uh, restaurants uh, are easily available uh, from many hours of the day. Sometimes you can go to, uh, uh, in any shopping, any, any uh, housing estate, um, any taman, you will find that there are restaurants. Sometimes some of them are open up to about 11 p.m. at night. And so it's not difficult to get a quick meal, whether it's a simple chakwe tiao or uh, roti chanai uh, with uh, chicken curry, etc. cetera. Or, and uh, a lot of the restaurants, therefore, are open and easily available, unlike in Europe or US. So I think e-commerce is something, uh, so, so many people just drive around or walk to the uh, nearest uh, restaurant of their, their favorite place for their meals and not order online. But with COVID-19, a lot of it was ordered online. Now, as I said, after COVID-19, what will happen to e-commerce? Uh, this is something left to be seen. Uh, we are doing some export, but our export is largely uh, live broiler and eggs and, uh, and some processed products. And uh, these live broiler and eggs are of course to Singapore, but the processed products 
now we are finding new markets. And this is an area of growth for exports. Now, let me go back and talk a little bit more about the traditional markets, wet markets particularly. Now, actually, wet market is not really new in this country. Um, you can see from these pictures here, um, we, we can have traditional markets going back to the colonial days and also when the new migrants came to Malaya. If you look at this picture here, this man, and this, by the way, was the central market before in the 1800s, central market in Kuala Lumpur in the 1800s. You look at him, he's wearing a, a, a pig tail uh, on the hair, and that you can identify uh, he's a man still dressed in the Qing dynasty in China, uh, that kind of attire. So he's a new migrant. He has not forgotten his uh, attire back in China uh, with a long pigtail. So that hair is combed and dressed like a pigtail, a queue, uh, a queue at the back. This is a kind of the, uh, market in the days. That, that market, of course, changed. And it came to be in the 1930s, um, at that time, a modern structure, a central market. You go inside there, you look at the interior, very high ceiling, very airy view. That high ceiling gives you uh, better ventilation and, uh, and then also compared to the ceiling here and very dark here. So this is a lot brighter and uh, less older, but it was still a wet market. Today, central market, in the year 2020, in fact, even before this, has now been converted to just an art and craft shop, art and craft center. So the wet markets, I'm trying to tell you, wet markets are changing. Now, these are, again, some wet markets uh, concept. Sometimes a mar wet market is not necessarily a, a market inside, inside a house condition. You find that it is just a hawker area along one of the roads that are identify uh, this was SS2. This picture was taken some time back. Uh, now it is a lot better. Now SS2 has changed. They have a roof over the, the, the area where, where this store was. Now, so you can see the, the chicken are, are eviscerated and uh, sold. Uh, here again, this is a Salayang wholesale market. They will do the slaughter and uh, either within the Salayang market or just outside Salayang market, and they be selling there. This was in Oak Clang Road, just outside the market. They also have a poultry processing area, and then they sell the freshly slaughtered inside the market. So this is a kind of uh, stalls in the wet market. But this kind of wet market are slowly in the larger towns, uh, giving way to dry markets. Why? Why one of the why dry wet markets have been replaced by dry markets? Uh, very large concern of the municipal council or city council was the pollution. And uh, every day they had to spend a lot of money cleaning the market, cleaning the waste pollution from the poultry slaughter in the market. And so this poultry, uh, after slaughter now, they are slaughtered outside the market somewhere, um, outside the market, not in the market itself, and then bring to the market. And but they are also delivered to the market fresh daily, marketed on a daily, daily basis. And this is an example in Shah Alam of a dry market, the store inside the dry market selling chicken. Now, the trend is changing in, in some countries, like this is an example in Singapore, where even in this dry market, now this is a hawker, this is a market, a traditional market, uh, in area in a uh, market center in Singapore. The chickens are not so uh, exposed like this, but they are in actually chillers uh, or refrigerated chillers. Simply in Bangkok, many of the poultry now sold in Bangkok are not sold in, in an open uh, concept like this, but sold in, uh, in chillers uh, whereby it's almost similar to what you see in, uh, in uh, modern trade. Of course, the products in the in the uh, traditional markets uh, are fairly similar. They focus on uh, Hobart, and Hobart is uh, here. They are doing a lot of times. They are what is called a standard cut, 
a standard dressed chicken that means with the head and feet on so you sell they sell you the chicken with head and feet on and then if you want they can cut off the feet for you and chop off the head for you as a service but you pay for the feet you pay for the head and the neck together and of course um this super uh, super, super chicken is sold without the head and feet on um some uh, dry market sell them but basically it is sold as a dress a standard dress and then they cut it off and became a super for you now many of the uh, the traditional markets are also selling parts uh, they can sell giblets they can sell quarter cuts and so on and so forth or you can sell you a, a whole leg now let's move on to modern trade and the modern trade uh, now the uh, these are a growing growing market trend but at, as it stands today they are still lose out to the traditional market so the, the bulk of the, the the poultry sold in the country is through the traditional market and i think modern trade only doing about 20 to 30 percent of the poultry sold into in in terms of marketing uh, examples are giant tesco and so on now they they sell a uh, whole chicken as a lady here is taking a whole chicken looking at it and uh, picking which is the whole chicken that they want but moving they are also now uh, a lot of the hypermarkets supermarkets are selling the parts uh, in the tray packs uh, and this kind of tray packs make it very convenient for the housewife to buy they don't have to buy the whole chicken they can buy just drumsticks or or, or wings or what have you uh, and and work on them now another another area of uh, promotion that the modern trade uh, that the hypermarkets supermarkets are working on is promoting a special branded so uh, super uh, this super dressed chicken they're branded as uh, antibiotic free hormone free omega and rich especially on the eggs omega plus eggs and so on and uh, with the health conscious people people are looking for some of this of course uh, in the modern trade especially in uh, the, the bigger ones they are insisting that they must get their supply from uh, vhm logo plants so this is an area of growth so traditional markets wet markets slowly replaced by dry dry markets dry markets the young people love to visit the modern trade not the older generation not the older generation also but the, old, the young generation don't like to visit wet market now I, as i said what are, what are some of the reasons for why the young children a uh, young generation the millennials like to look at uh, shopping in in modern trade it's air conditioned comfort long operating hours many of the traditional markets after 12 o'clock you hardly see any more trade there plenty of ample parking space and uh, as i said vhm plants so they know that this is uh, food safety this is and the pro the product can be kept uh, in the in the in, in the home refrigerator without too much of a worry um, many people uh, housewife today they buy they don't do they don't, don't go to the market every day especially they are working couples they would buy uh, two days a week or three or one day a week or three days a week and then a lot of times they are actually kept in the refrigerators now so the the, the modern trade they can keep uh, their products in chillers and freezers to maintain the freshness now i, I mentioned just now about horeca and uh, i as i said i like to take the uh, definition of horeca unlike the, the European definition to a little bit more wider to include some of these are uh, these are uh, uh, actually brew house and uh, a few others uh, Uncle Don's here. some of them are actually just drinking places uh. um, but we have also uh, many uh, other restaurants uh, where you can go in and dine in uh, pizza hunts and secret recipe now there are many mama uh, restaurants in in malaysia whereby you can go in and have tandoori chicken or curry chicken and so on and so forth 
And many Malaysian restaurants are also a very diverse category. A very distinct category, of course, is the quick service restaurant I mentioned. And uh, Subway is increasing in popularity. Um, the e-commerce, I talked about e-commerce just now, the manufacturers and the export market. Now, again, uh, I think this is Orica. It's an iconic business. Uh, I think you recognize some of the brands that I put in here. I'm not publicizing any of the brand. Uh, I'm just giving you an example of what uh, a, mama, a mama restaurant like this one. Uh, I, I put this picture. It's this Palita. I could have put in Nasi Kanda Kayu uh, or something like that. But I'm not promoting Palita as such. Now, when many of the uh, traditional markets and distributors uh, of uh, wholesalers are also targeting to a lot of these chicken rice shops, uh, stalls. The chicken rice shops like some specialized uh, TCRS, chicken rice shop, the chicken rice shop, uh, very popular and very it was expanded very fast. Um, there's the Ipoh chicken rice, many of you will recognize. Uh, when you go to, uh, then you go to Ipo, the Lo Wong, uh, Choi Kai, or Lo Wong Chicken and Tauge, you recognize them. There's a, there's a branch, uh, uh, a franchise called TK Chong, which also specializes on selling chicken. Nam Hyung also selling and chicken rice. But you go to any coffee shop in Malaysia, invariably you'll find someone selling chicken rice. And of course, they have two types. One is uh, steamed chicken rice. They call it a Hainani, Hainani, Hainanese chicken rice. And of course, the roast chicken. And this is an example of a plate of steamed chicken rice. Manufacturers, many of them are actually uh, working on um, snack foods. Um, that means uh, patties, sausages, meatloaf, nuggets, and so on. But of course, many are also move on to uh, ready to eat meals. So value meals, uh, again, these are, are trade, traded through a modern trade and where uh, a busy housewife can put up, pick up a value meal and send it out. But these are very common uh, going through uh, some of the fast food restaurants. Um, so a manufacturer can be supplying this to their, their, their clients, which are uh, quick service restaurants. Uh, this, this you can see is a breaded uh, Thai meat, breaded Thai meat in between the bun. You can also now go into more, more exciting things than just a, a patty, a breaded patty is basically what's called breaded patty. You can go into uh, little pieces of chicken breaded and uh, taking on a name of karage, which is Japanese. Oh, uh, now this is a very traditional product. It's not uh, a Western product, uh, boxing chicken, although you'll find it in the US as well. Um, but this, this product is not new. Now, time factor, I must remember that. Now, basically, I say there are now seven market segments, including manufacturers, because I'm looking at manufacturers as an end user for the producer or the processor. Uh, and now of course, the manufacturer would move on to a restaurant or to a caterer. Now, as I mentioned just now, the traditional market still uh, com uh, command a bulk, a lion's share of the trade today, but modern trade is gaining popularity in overseas, I mean, in the Western countries, you very hard for you to find traditional markets, but traditional markets still exist in many Asian, Asian countries. The modern trade are, tie, uh, are more popular with the younger generation. Um, they don't like the smell walking in the wet market and uh, a modern trade, they can do a lot of other shopping as well um, in, in this kind of uh, whether you know, in Tesco or Giant or whatever. You now, many, as I said, many municipal councils are trying to phase out the wet market because of pollution problem, because of fly problem, odor problems. 
And so they are converting many of them. Uh, in the Klang Valley, if you go to Tun Dr. Ismail, you go to Taman Mega, you go to um, now even Penang, they are talking about converting the wet markets to dry markets. And the traditional markets uh, obtain their non the 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 products from non vet non VHM slaughter facilities. Hygiene and sanitation needs to be looked at and improved. The uh, poultry exports uh, largely only to uh, live birds and eggs to Singapore, and we have yet to fully develop the rest. Now, e-commerce is something to look at. Just a very quick glance at this. Uh, again, as I said, the whole bird. 50% go through the whole wet market and supermarket. A lot uh, now are some are turning to cut up parts, which only about 20% of the product uh, sold in the market. With that, I thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and pass you back to uh, Mr. Terry Tan, our moderator. Thank you, Dr. Yap, for your valuable insights on the market segments for processed poultry products. Dr. Yap just highlighted that there are seven market segments for the poultry products in Malaysia that you can refer to his uh, presentation slides later on. He also mentioned that there is a trend of a uh, transformation from traditional wet market to modern trades and a uh, dry market to attract youngsters to visit and uh, providing more hygiene and uh, safety products to people in Malaysia. Um, Thanks, Dr. Ya, for your sharing that uh, the market segment in Malaysia that I believe that all of us have a very good insight about uh, the markets in Malaysia. Uh, we still have uh, 27 minutes to go to the Q&A. Uh, without wasting any time, uh, we will proceed to the Q&A. Can uh, all the panelists to turn on your uh, video and uh, microphone? Thank you very much. And uh, we will go through first come first step. We will go through one by one. Mm -hmm. And I believe that some of the questions Mr. Ong, uh, Mr. Ong have has answered that <laughs> very fast. Mr. Yeah. Ong, you are the yeah. very fast. I like your stuff. Yeah. <laughs> All right, then we oh, oh, oh answer by Mr. Ong, eh? Okay. Still, there are six open. Uh, honestly, that today we mean uh, there are less questions posted in the Q and A. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I believe that everyone uh, got a very good uh, information from this webinar. So, for the first one, hi, doctor. Uh, hi. Uh, referring to your to you, this question. Uh, to this SCCP principle number three. May I check with you on how many percents of a uh, rupture of the intense, intestinal and uh, visceral damage is recommended as control limit? Well, very technical. How to e evaluate the degree of damage? Okay. So for the rupture of intestine, the percentage of the rupture or damage, it depends on the efficiency of the eviscerator machine. So, uh, uh, the plant need to check back their eviscerator machine, what is the specification, and what is the efficiency of the eviscerator. Then we can get the percentage of the uh, rupture as a critical limit. Can, can you give an example that what is a percentage in a non -co uh, co common practice? The common practice usually uh, about 3%. 3% or 5%, but it will depends on the eviscerator efficiency machine. Okay. Because when you buy uh, the eviscerator machine, it's maybe 100% uh, efficiency, but then you need to do the validation, anything to check back how much the efficiency of the machine. All right, I, I hope that uh, Dr. Rohezan has just answered the question for that. And... Uh... Oh, doctor, your question to you again. Okay. okay. Can help clarify the CCP's example for 1.5 liter carcass for inside-outside washer? 
what are the critical that set the process as CCP? Is there any processing plants that does? Also, I would like to ask according to DVS standard, spin chiller require minimum 0.75 liter for carcass. Is it still relevant to your opinion? Okay, for the CCP inside and outside uh, washer, actually the water volume will be depends on the critical limit that uh, set up by the establishment. They need to do validation and they will get the how many uh, volume of the water that need uh, to clean the carcass inside and outside the washer. Am I questioning the? Uh, am I answering the question? Yeah, I believe so. But how about the 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 spin chiller? Oh, the spin chiller. The next question, for my opinion, it will depends on the uh, size of the capacity of the spin chiller. Uh, because nowadays, uh, maybe the big company they have a big size of uh, spin chiller. Then they need to calculate again uh, the 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 volume the in the spin chiller. It depends on the size of the capacity. Okay, so is it 0 0.75 is uh, required by the DBS or is a, is common? I'm, I'm, actually, I'm not sure the standard one, but uh, for my opinion, uh, nowadays, there's a lot of uh, spin chiller, maybe it's the modern one, the big capacity. So they need to check again with the uh, the the engineer, uh, then uh, to validate again the is it uh, same with the standard or not? Oh, okay, so it means that the zero point seven five liter uh, per carcass is not is not the DBS standard, right? So uh, I'm not sure <laughs> because <laughs> for my opinion, uh, during this time maybe uh, it depends on the size of the capacity of the spin chiller. All right, maybe you can uh, try to find out whether it's a standard yes. or okay. it's a requirement for uh, industry player to, to uh, set up the, for the spin chiller. Thank, thank you, doctor. And, uh, oh, okay. Doctor, I, they, they, they like you so much. A lot of questions to you. Okay. So I think a lot of they're interested in the HSCCP. Eh? So it's a good sign that people are moving towards to the HSCCP. All right, so... Uh, do all the processing plants, HSCCP now, who will be the people enforcing the HSCCP at those plants that is from DV, DVS uh, department, right? At the moment, uh, only the VHM uh, certified uh, certification under DVS, in, under DVS certification, implement hazard system. But uh, as we know that 70% of the slaughterhouses in Malaysia uh, still a small size enterprise and uh, do not have a BHM. But uh, DVS in the process of revising our uh, Animal Act so that all uh, the poultry slaughterhouse will be under DVS supervision, but it will take time because it's related with the regulation. Any, any foresee any uh, expectation time frame to, to, to achieve the, uh, the goal of uh, 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 DBS monitoring? Uh, at years. the moment, we, we just do the uh, consultation to the small uh, enterprise, small size enterprise. For example, at the uh, Terengganu in Kelantan because uh, most of the slaughterhouse is small, uh, small size enterprise. So DBS officer, uh, the, the veterinary officer, uh, sometimes they go to the slaughterhouse and then they give the uh, means uh, human asihat uh, to upgrade their uh, slaughterhouse. Oh, all right. Okay. Thank you, doctor. And uh, uh, sorry, doctor. Yep, you will be the next question. Another question from uh, doctor. <laughs> so, what are the main issues encountered by slaughtering uh, slaughterhouse in terms of uh, exporting poultry meats and value added product? Besides HACCP, what can DBS do to support the export market? I think it's more. Uh, okay, for the export one, because uh, poultry and meat poultry is considered as high risk product. So, uh, for the product to be exported to other countries, it depends on the uh, importing country requirement. 
uh, must comply with the implementing uh, requirements. Some of the countries such as Singapore, Japan, they have a strict uh, requirement to export to their country. And HACCP is one of the uh, compulsory for them. Uh, maybe the, the establishment can export to other countries that uh, do not require the HACCP and maybe uh, less uh, import uh, country requirement. All right. Maybe Dr. Yap, we can uh, uh, add on some points of this question that besides HSP, what can DBS to support a small market? I think it's more a market, right? Dr. Yap? Yeah, I, I think uh, there are many things to do here to uh, get, to try to uh, improve our, um, our export market potential. We, we have a potential for exporting market. Uh, our labor production costs uh, is probably as competitive as our neighbors like Thailand. And uh, because of our more liberal uh, policies on the importation of grain versus like what is in Thailand, where they have to use a high percentage of their local grain. And so our, our production cost in terms of uh, at the farm level is very competitive. Our production Productivity at on many of our farms, particularly those that are on a close house basis, are very 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 good. I think we, we can we can have achieved a fairly good FCR. Um, so our poultry process, uh, poultry producers, farmers are actually quite good. Um, of course, there's still plenty of room for improvement. Uh, plenty of uh, so a lot of things that the government has to help the industry to transform from open house to closed house. But it's a very big subject. I don't want to go too much into that now. Mm. And I think, um, but we are looking at it. We are looking at the government is looking at it. FLFM is looking at it and working with the government to see how this can be done. And also um, DVS is promoting MindGap. Unfortunately, MindGap uh, is still uh, confined largely to the farms that are at the ex in the South and not not that many takers in the north. Uh, it has not become mandatory yet. So it's just a voluntary uh, uh, scheme for people to take on. Now these are, without mind gap, you cannot talk about export yet. Yeah? Because if you don't have a system now, and any country coming in to look at whether they can buy your product or not, first they want to look at how you control the product at the farm level. It's not just, your processing plant alone. They will go back to see, well, how are you producing this? Uh, now, even animal welfare is a standard by itself for export. So you, you see the biosecurity, the hygiene and sanitation, the flock health management in, in your farms, all that has to be taken into consideration, largely already uh, uh, taken care of by MindGap. And then animal welfare also now is coming into consideration. Now we we have to to strengthen all this uh, in order to get sufficient numbers. Now the other thing about export is efficiency at the processing, and I think uh, I don't want to talk too much because Ong Chai Kin has uh, addressed this very well. Um, you, are your processing standards up to the standard for export? Yeah. So I think if you if you take uh, by and large, uh, how many processing plants we have in the country? Uh, if those those that are SMEs and those that are without even VHM, forget about it. Yeah. So I, I think you have to look at it is a VHM, and then you have to look at your your biosecurity control and so on and so forth. Even in your processing plant. So there are many steps, and then we also but the potential is there. We talked to in my trade at one of our one of our webinar. We talk about how to promote export, and my trade is just waiting to help processors producers to export. Jakim is also helping to export, and Jakim has got a very good uh, uh, reputation as a very credible uh, halal uh, accreditation uh, forum uh, uh, platform. So I think our potential is there, but what, what is needed in this poultry industry is to how to make uh, 
a product that comes out from the farm at a very competitive price into a product after processing that is competitive. Now, this, unfortunately, there is still a lot of work to do because uh, going from a, a, a farm product, a broiler, a broiler like bird, to the product that you can export, you need economy of scale, you need a high productivity, you need good quality control, and you need to really bring down your processing costs, your logistic costs and processing costs. This, I mean, that means what? Improving your yield and improving your, your overall uh, other processing. So there are many challenges here. Many, some of which I think Ong Chai Kin has uh, addressed. So Mr. Ong has already addressed some of this. And I think uh, one of the reasons why uh, the organizers of this webinar use Ong Chai Kin for this presentation is because uh, another area that uh, which we didn't talk about here, but we did talk about it in another webinar was the importation of uh, products, right? So the importation of products doesn't necessarily help the producers in the country. Yeah. But as long as you have a lot of uh, product coming in cheaply from other countries, some might even be subsidized, cross subsidized. Uh, I, I don't want to explain the concept of cross subsidizing here. Uh, it takes too long. And, um, and then uh, th whenever they have some offer, they bring it in. Cheap, they offer. They bring. If they cannot go to very restrictive markets, very high uh, demanding quality standards, then they'll try to bring it into the country. So into this Malaysia. So we, we are facing this. That kind of importation hampers the processes from going into what Mr. Ong Chai Kin was uh, promulgating, promoting just now. Now, we need the government support in this. We need government support. You must give some kind of a more, uh, support, policy support to the local processes to, to expand and, and invest into the industry, into the processing industry, so that we become competitive in the export market. As long as you open your door to anybody who wants to come in and import the chicken, that's very difficult. I'm not saying that, that DVS is doing that, right? DVS has a lot of control now. I know that DVS is working very hard to control this, but I think we need to have a bit more caution on this area. Oh, all right, thank you for your, Dr. Yap, thank you for your uh, explanation. And uh, I think you you have just explained what uh, the question was asking. And I believe that uh, the, the floor will definitely understand that uh, how we're going to take to, for the exportation market is basically from plum and uh, towards the end products. So the performance management system has to be in place uh, even in the uh, farming, sorting plants, uh, every single process. Okay, then we go to the next question. Uh, we not much question. We still have time to finish all this. With ten minutes, we can finish all this. Yes, five questions. Doctor Yap, Singapore has just approved self culture chicken meat. What do you think and its potential as modern or future market? Doctor Yap, we can answer. Maybe Mister Ong also can answer this. I, I believe you come across this right. Is a the, the cell culture chicken meat? Yeah, so, I, I I think yes yes there's a uh, a lot of talk about it, but you know, consumers in this country are very are very careful. Uh, they they want to look at uh, not they even want to look at uh, how the chicken is being produced, whether it's organic not organic. Now this kind of cell culture meat is from the laboratory. Uh, what goes into it? Uh, not many consumers know what, what is happening there. Secondly, customers, if you, if you observe carefully, how do they go, how do they do the marketing? You go to them, they would like to pick up the chicken even, you know, and turn it around this way, that way, and say, okay, this is, this is the chicken that I want. They take up a tray pack, they turn it this way, that way, and say, okay, this is the pack I want. So can you do that with a cell culture meat? You, 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 you have no idea how this was produced. So I think it's a, it's a very minor, very, very minor uh, uh, manifestation. And I, I do not see that this is going to threaten 
the, the mainstream producers. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. I believe so. Huh? Uh, this cell culture chicken, as I know, that is a very niche market and uh, it's uh, produced in lab and uh, in the factory. And uh, some people might, might like it is uh, more hygiene, right? They claim that it's more hygiene, less diseases. And uh, like Mr. Ong just explained that we need to implementing a lot, invest a lot of uh, machinery, automation machinery uh, to get the best product out from the factory. And uh, this cell culture, I, I, I guess it's just a, just a, a new trend, new trend in, um, in, 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 in this world. So any comment from Mr. Ong from your side that is a, you, you take it, this uh, cell culture chicken meat is a, is a trait to, the, to your sorting plant industry? Uh, my personal opinion, uh, this uh, cell culture meat uh, is not well accepted by people at this uh, point of time. And as a consumer point, like uh, Patea mentions, I think not many people will opt go for the cell culture meat. So for next 10 or 20 years, we may not know what will happen in future. Thank you, Dr. Ong. I, I guess most of the people still like the, the what I mean, the real, real chicken meat and the real eggs instead of uh, uh, produced in the lab. All right, then we go for the next question that, uh, oh, this is a, I don't think we can answer that, right? In Malaysia, produce the cheapest poultry meat. Why are people are still smuggling them? I think, I think Marquis can answer that. Dr. Yeo, you want to answer that? Or just make it, Dr. Yeo? Or maybe just make it short for this one. I think. Well, I think smuggling activity will always uh, go on. I think... Uh... You you very hard to uh, uh, if somebody wants to get rid of some chicken quickly and uh, uh, they 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 can find a source of a cheap chicken and then they want to bring it over into the country uh, if and they 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 probably it's a non non authorized you see to bring in chicken from uh, from overseas first of all you must get DVS approval you must get uh, DVS must send a team of experts to inspect the factory right. Just like if you want to export, then DVS will have to inspect your factory and certify that your, your products are fit for consumption and, and free from uh, health hazards, then you can export. Now, there are, there are small producers and processors outside, the, outside this country who, who want to sell their product. They, they, they cannot get DVS approval. What do, how they, and, and once they want to bring it into Malaysia and then they can sell it cheap, what do you do? We smuggle, right? So I think we, we, we should never talk about smuggling. I mean, if it's a threat, then I think uh, we should, in, we should uh, ask the, our custom and our border control and uh, markets to take a good look at it. Because if it's a really, really big threat, then I think that is something to look at. I mean, uh, smuggling happens with everything. Lah, yeah? Thank you, Dr. Yap. I, I think it's a responsibility for everyone here. And uh, as a as a resident in uh, as a as a Malaysian, uh, to prevent to prevent any smuggling, not only the poultry meats or other other things, so it's our responsibility to not to do that, especially the smuggler. If you're not doing that, there will not be any smuggling to the Malaysia. And then you know that is against the government rules and regulation that we shouldn't do that. Even that is a good business, because while we're doing that, that you will harm our. Uh, industry, then uh, some of the people can lose a lot of uh, money and uh, people will lose their jobs. And uh, because of your self selfishness, selfishness. and uh, I hope that uh, throughout this webinar that uh, the, the question being asked uh, in the floor that we can uh, uh, pass a message to the people that do not do smuggling or any, any, any against the uh, rule and regulation in Malaysia. All right, is there any timeline set by the, uh, so for the, the, the question for Hugh Take Long, is there any timeline set by the government banning the live bird slaughtering in the wet market? Uh, Dr. Rohaizan, do you have any info of this? And I believe that we have been talking about this quite some times, right? 
I'm sorry. Can you repeat the answer? Uh, it, repeat the question. Sorry. It's really timeline. Timeline set by the government. Banning, banning the live birds sorting in a wet market. Actually, uh, the the regulation or rules have been done by uh, the council, the the local council is under their regulation that they don't allow any more uh, slaughtering at the uh, wet market. But I think the implementation of the enforcement is still a big issue, uh, and we can see still. Uh, the, the the slaughtering happen in the wet market. The one need to uh, refer to the different agency also because DPS and the local council uh, are working together. Okay, thank you. I just uh, I try to answer to the, to the question. Thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Rohaizan. And uh, to add on some that, uh, yes, uh, depending on the uh, states, uh, government for the implementation. The rule and regulation have been uh, 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 introduced, but it's just an implementation at uh, every single state. All right, to Dr. Yap and Mr. Ong, how to make sure all slaughterhouse follow VHM as to make sure food safety to the Malaysian? Not voluntary from uh, Rahizat. Yep. I think, uh, let me answer. Uh, so. As I said just now, um, and also what Dr. Ryzen just said, there are two classes of slaughterhouse in the country. Those that are run, that are under the VHM local plan uh, uh, certification, therefore they are under the jurisdiction of DVS. They also have, a, of, of course, a business license from the municipal council. But there are many slaughterhouses that are actually under the jurisdiction of the uh, Dewan Bandaraya or the local councils, all right, or municipal councils. And um, they have not made it mandatory that they must have VHM, because VHM is DVS, right? So unless the municipal council say, okay, I want VHM to, uh, DVS to come in. VHM is a, is a policy, it's a ministerial uh, responsibility. Uh, DVS also cannot simply go in. Now, I think back there, doc, I should let Dr. Rohazan talk about this, but uh, many years of experience in, in DVS myself. We cannot simply cross over boundaries and say, I want to take over your slaughterhouses just like that. The, the municipal council have a revenue base for a lot of these slaughterhouses also. And then you, you cannot just simply take over their slaughterhouses and say, I want to run it under the VHM. There has to be a, a, a shift of a transfer of jurisdiction in the first place, as well as then also the question then comes also back to DVS. Do you have enough manpower to really take over all the bench, all the slaughter, slaughter facilities in the country? So there are, this is a very big question, very big uh, subject. And I think um, it must, it, of course, we must move forward. We must move forward. The other thing, of course, maybe is to, to make sure that uh, the municipal council, local councils improve the hygiene sanitation as well as the meat inspection, all right? Now, if I were to draw on my experience overseas, not every, every slaughterhouse is under Department of Agriculture or Department of Veterinary Services. There are under municipal councils and they are in fact parked directly under the Ministry of Health but they have, they have meat inspectors. They are very qualified, very well-trained meat inspectors and hygiene and sanitation officers, all right? Uh, inspecting all these slaughterhouses and butcher shops. So you, and you can see that many of those slaughterhouses, they're not under the Department of Agriculture, they're not under the Department of Veterans Services, but they're under the Ministry of Health, uh, the, the, the Department of Health under the Municipal Council and they do a very good job. They have very good meat inspectors, very qualified. So it's a policy decision that has to be made. All right. Thank, thank you, Dr. Yeah. I think you have answered it clearly for uh, this question. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, 
the last question is not the question, by the way, it's a 50% uh, non-VHM plan. Yeah, maybe more. Yeah, it's not the question. Uh, I guess there's no more question uh, from the floor. And thank you. Thank you to all the speakers today and for your insightful info and variable discussion on the topic that are related to modern poultry processing in Malaysia. Okay, I would like to summarize for today's webinar. To, to hi the highlighted point from our first speaker, our respected uh, speaker, Mr. Ong, and uh, he mentioned the automated to drive a higher efficiency, new technology to drive the consistency of quality such as ACM, ASRS, and he also mentioned the digitalization, big data, IoT technology in the uh, slotting plants. Mm. He to take home from our second speaker, Dr. Rohaizan, uh, basically the importance of implementing the HACCP in processing plants. And key to take home from our doctor from our Dr. Yap, understanding our market segments and the supply chain in Malaysia the importance and uh, upgrading from a conventional wet market to modern trade and dry market to achieve hygiene and uh, safety foods to people. Before we are ending this webinar, I would like to thank our organize, organizer, AgroFood Productivity Nexus, AFPN, and FLFAM, and MPC. To our speaker, Mr. Ong, Dr. Rohaizan and uh, Dr. Yap, who have given a valuable and uh, informative presentation today, and especially to the MPC team who are helping and making our webinar successful. Kate Nadia, our MC today, and Puan Safura, and Puan uh, Fatima, and the rest of the team members. Lastly, to our respected audience to give your valuable time to attend our webinar today. Uh, I believe today's topics are more interesting and informative to private and public sectors. The very last webinar, number 10, is on the 12th December, on Saturday, 12th December 2020. We'll be presenting the modern poultry processing. This will be our final webinar to highlight the challenges in Malaysian poultry industry and uh, what we can learn and strategize to achieve the sustainability in business. Firstly, to explore the various, various strategies and uh, avenues for the poultry industry. Secondly, to diversify both in nature and in scope to stay sustainability. Uh, beside that, uh, we hope that uh, our Malaysian government will fully support in our industry to grow and to become number one in Asia in terms of our most advanced in terms of technology and the greatest of exportation in figure. Since the, our government has been encouraging uh, our industry players to implement the IR 4.0 to achieve the greater efficiencies. And we would like to see more on the supports of packages to, to the industry in terms of uh, encouraging the exportation of poultry products, especially that we need to upgrading ourselves in the downstream industry, such as the sorting plants and the future processing plant. Okay, uh, please, the next slide. Uh, okay, this slide, yes. Please register early and uh, share with your colleagues and friends to attend the final webinar. And uh, of course, you can share all the recorded video as you can, you, you, that you can access from uh, MPC website. Uh, thank you very much to all the panelists today and to the audience. I would like to pass the mic to MC today to end our webinar today. Thank you, Mr. Terry and all uh, speakers for the sharing. Um, so just a friendly reminder, the email, stay tuned. The invitation will be emailed to all the participants today as soon as possible. And I think it has been a great day and a wonderful afternoon with all of you. Again, um, thank you and see you this Saturday. Bye.